Welcome everyone uh, to our first AMA ever. And the, you know, this is, was actually a decision based upon how many questions we were seeing uh, online on Twitter and in discord and a number of other places. And we just thought, well, would you guys be interested in an AMA? And we put a survey out there and uh, the highest vote, ca uh, vote count came back as yes, we want to know more about hardware and software. And I said, okay, I think I know the right two guys to answer those questions. So uh, today we've got uh, two of our two of our uh, senior leaders here from Grok, and uh, I love that Igor's using his rock star name today, Igor X. It's uh, it's it's perfect for the stage. And then uh, uh, Mr. Andrew Links. I'll have you guys uh, just introduce yourselves to to everybody real quick. Igor, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. My name is Igor Osovsky. I lead the Silicon team at Grok. Uh, before Grok, I was at Google leading the, the physical design implementation on the TPU and the various different accelerators there. Um, and before that, I was the CTO of the ASIC business unit at Marvell. This is the custom chip uh, unit at Marvell. Very <clears throat> cool. Thank you, Igor. And Mr. Ling, looking awesome. dapper as always, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, my name's Andrew Ling. Uh, I lead the compiler and software work here at Grok. Um, so been here, you know, roughly four years prior to that, I spent most of my career building compilers, uh, at various semiconductor companies, um, you know, focused primarily on spatial architectures. And then that kind of morphed, you know, post the sort of AlexNet craze in 2012 into machine learning compilers. Uh, and then I ended up here. That's awesome. I'm sorry, I'm getting uh, I'm getting asked if I want to boost the server because we have so many people trying to get in right now. I, uh, I'll leave that for the team. They can they can figure that out if we want to boost it, or we'll just keep this uh, we'll keep this exclusive to the club we've got here. Cool. Well, and my name is Mark Keeps. For those of you that uh, that don't know me, I'm the uh, tech evangelist here at Grok and uh, a number of other things. <laughs> <laughs> that, that we work on. So what we're going to do today is uh, a couple of things. We actually asked the community, what questions did you want answers to um, regarding Grok at these, these early days of excitement around Grok with the community? And then um, we also want to be able to open up to the chat and gather those questions. So my team is watching that and they're going to they're gonna share those across with me so that I can ask those questions on your behalf. So I guess with that, we should just dive right in because everyone's been, been very, very curious. So I've got, I've got the captured questions, guys. I'm going to, I'm going to jump right into them. And I think the first one is, is, is right at the heart and soul of the curiosity. So the question was what makes the LPU highly performant at inference compared to GPUs? And I think, you know, this is, this is one of those things that we talk about all the time at Grok. Everyone else is a little bit more new to it. You know, we get compared to GPUs a lot, the, the methodology that people traditionally evaluate GPUs. But the person added to the question, they said, we've heard about deterministic approach to reduce latency, but we actually want to understand the specifics on how this is achieved, um, you know, at least anything that you can share publicly. So let's start with Igor, because, you know, the secret sauce is the hardware but the hardware was designed because of the software compiler coming first. So let's start with you first, Igor, and maybe explain that, uh, that advantage for us. Yeah, no, that sounds good, Mike. Um, let me bring up a slide. I think this is much better if you have a visual to it. So let me know if you can see it. I see something loading. Okay. Oh, there's, there's an alert symbol, though. There's an alert symbol. Do you not see it? I see it on my side. Andrew, do you see it on your side? No, it's still loading. Still loading for me too. Dots. Okay. Oh, weird. Okay. Um, okay. Let me let me start talking about it, and then hopefully we can figure out what the loading problem is. Not yet, classic. Okay. Um, Okay, it's funny because it worked before. All right, so let's let's kind of dive into it. Uh, so uh, if we look at um, if we look at the, the LPU versus the GPU, so the GPU uh, was something that was developed for the purposes of graphics processing. So it is a uh, device that kind of uh, started being developed about 20, 25 years ago for the uh, graphics acceleration. Um, the device 
contains large number of um, um, large number of uh, of uh, cores that are all executing uh, uh, in parallel, uh, right. and these. Can you guys hear me okay or no? Yeah, I can hear yep. you. Yeah. Okay. So these cores are executing in parallel, and um, uh, these cores are really non-deterministic in nature. What I mean by that is that the time to complete a specific task by each of the cores depends whether the the data that you're working with is in your level one cache or whether you need to grab it from the level two cache or you need to go into uh, DRAM and in which case the DRAM uh, kind of latencies to access that data uh, takes a long time. Um, and when you have lots of non-deterministic cores like this, uh, you're kind of at the uh, as slow as your slowest core. And then when you work with multiple chips like this, um, you're kind of as slow as the slowest chip that has the slowest core. And kind of you have this at every uh, checkpoint during the execution of a specific program. Um, the LPU works in a very different way. It's fully deterministic. What we mean by that, we don't have a memory uh, cache hierarchy. Uh, we just have flat access to memory, which means that uh, we can access um, we can access that memory directly, uh, and we can predict where the data is moving on the chip down to a nanosecond. Mm. So this is really helpful on the hardware side because you can actually plan your hardware in a very regular fashion that's really uh, efficient. Um, but it also helps uh, on the software side uh, to kind of uh, to kind of uh, easily place algorithms into the hardware. So, can you guys see the screen that I'm sharing yet, or not no? Yet? It, it's still. It looks like there's something on your account side that it needs to be addressed. Although someone says they can see. Wait, yeah, some people say I can see. Others say screen isn't loading. Looks like it's a mixed bag, depending on yeah. on who's getting it, who isn't. It says okay. there is LPU inference engine on screen so yeah yeah so um so uh, maybe maybe if somebody can uh, bring up my ai epiphany slides um, uh, mark i don't know if you have access or andrew uh, i can share these with you but um yeah. what i'll do in the meantime is kind of describe it in a little more detail um so on the LPU side, this is a silicon that was implemented in 14 nanometer. Um, so this is a very simple piece of uh, kind of uh, of hardware. It's um, a 14 nanometer single chip module, no HPMs, no large uh, COAS silicon interposer. Uh, the cost of this device is about an order of magnitude uh, more uh, cheaper than than like a, a GPU like H100. And yet we're achieving this amazing performance out of this uh, device. Um, so I, I kind of touched a little bit on the, the, the chip side, but the story really spans across the system, uh, not just at the chip level, but at the system level and the software above it. So I'll let Andrew kind of maybe talk a little bit about how this determinism and the predictable uh, kind of hardware behavior enables the software to kind of uh, move quickly and achieve really high performance. Uh, so maybe I'll stop there and try to figure out how I share better on, on this channel. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. go for it. Go for it, uh, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes the way I like to think about it is first just understanding, you know, how existing substrates and technologies solve these LLMs. So let, let's take a look at multi-core CPU or graphics cards for that matter. You know, how effectively do they actually run these things? So this is getting a little bit into the weeds, but if you take a look at a typical LLM, it's going to be a chain of a bunch of decoders, let's say. So Llama 2, you got 80 decoders. How does that actually run on a CPU or a graphics card? Well, they basically just run it serially. So they'll take the first decoder, run it on the silicon, dump the weights back into HBM, uh, sorry, and then dump the, the activations back in, and then they'll run the next decoder. So decoder two, and then three, and then four, and so on. So they're effectively time multiplexing the hardware. So what are we doing? We're basically flipping that on its head. We're actually scaling across space as opposed to time. So imagine now I have one dedicated chip for each of these decoders, and they're running in kind of like this pipeline parallel fashion, you know, kind of like an assembly line. That's effectively how we're doing it today, and that's why we're so much faster. 
so the natural question so so what like well you know you're deterministic how does this interplay with all this well the fact that we are able to scale in space makes this the only reason this is possible is because we are deterministic you know as uh igor alluded to if you have no idea how long each of these chips is going to run you're going to be overly conservative in terms of getting the data uh, from each of these chips. So ultimately, your slowest chip is going to determine the performance, and you end up being super slow as you scale across each of these chips. That's exactly the problem that you see with these non-deterministic CPUs and graphics cards. Because they can't really decide how to split up the problem in a clear way, to effectively use these chips in a pipeline parallel fashion. We don't suffer from that. And that's ultimately why we get these blazing speeds across Mixtral and all these Lama models. So yeah, hopefully so that makes sense on a high level. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I guess I guess the key takeaway is with the more traditional incumbent architectures, what you guys are saying is you can only be as fast as the weakest link in that system. Right. And we don't struggle with that. And I like the factory analogy. You know, we've, we've talked about this before for anybody that has ever studied the industrial revolution, you know, what made the factory line so powerful was that once upon a time, if you built a product, your workers would literally walk to different stations, moving the product around the factory. Right. And so that caused you to be very slow, have issues between each station as they're doing the work. As soon as they figured out to bring the tooling to the factory line, and one line was where everybody sat and worked on it as the product moved through, suddenly they gained all of this efficiency and reduced risk to the product because you're not moving it off of the line. It's sort of the same idea. That's in essence what you guys are describing, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. But I think it's a great analogy, Mark. I think it's um, uh, in the GPU case, you're kind of using the HPMs to store your um, your machines and you bring them on to the main floor, which is the key die, uh, the core die, and you operate on a specific data. And then you bring new machines from the storage. The problem is when you're bringing these machines from your HPM to your factory floor to do the next level of processing, that costs both power because you're moving a lot of data back and forth and also um, the bandwidth from an HPM, uh, even though it's called a high bandwidth memory, it's still like drinking through a tiny little straw compared to the SRAM <laughs> bandwidth that you have on a chip, right? It's about 100x um, uh, lower bandwidth to a single HPM versus the SRAM that we have on, on our die. So we can get that um, uh, a lot. We can get a lot more processing done versus moving uh, data back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I liked I liked the analogy uh, that I heard the other day. It was a little bit like driving on. Hatija will appreciate this. Driving like the uh, uh, the exits in New Jersey, where you have the teapot kettle roundabout. You have to you have to go round and round and round every time you exit off of the freeway before you can get back on the freeway. And uh, we don't have that problem. Uh, well, let's jump jump to the next question. I apologize to everybody. It seems like some folks are seeing the screen, some folks are not. I actually saw it for about eight seconds and then it disappeared again. So I think this might be a Discord thing uh, with our first time trying to use Discord for this. Um, okay, so the second question that we got is, do you see Grok chips only being used for LLMs or do you believe there are other good use cases? For example, can Grok accelerate processing questions in computer vision AI like NERF or, you know, or is it really just good with LLMs? And I think this is funny. I'm gonna point this one to Andrew first. Uh, I find this really, really interesting because we've been around obviously for nearly eight years. And if anybody looked at um, our videos from our early events, I mean, we've done GNNs, RNNs, we've done computational fluid dynamics. We worked on drug discovery models with the national labs. But, you know, I think getting into the, the, the weeds of it, Andrew, you know, is it just LLMs? What's your perspective from the compiler? Yeah, I mean, it's, you're absolutely right there, right? Like it's a superset of LLMs. So we do have the world's fastest uh, LLM accelerator in the LPU. That's definitely true. Mm -hmm. um, but to, you know, let's decompose the LLM problem. Like what is this? Is at its core, the biggest operations are a bunch of matrix operations, right? So naturally that's gonna help other workloads. So things like CNNs, you know, things like graph neural networks, we fundamentally will still be able to be effective on those workloads because we have these kind of think of them like these heavy hammers 
on the sides mm -hmm. of our chips, which are really just linear algebra solvers. Uh, in addition to that, like the chip is essentially, uh, uh, it is Turing complete, right? Like we have a full set of instructions to actually take care of these nonlinear functions that are quite common with all these machine learning workloads. And so that in conjunction with the matrix engines on the end makes the chip very versatile. Um, and this is more than just like, you know, words. Like we, we have seen this with our customers where they've sped up key applications uh, you know, 10x, 100x, and drug mm. discovery, and that one was huge. Know, yeah, fluid dynamics, all these things. We've seen these accelerations. So, uh, the chip is actually quite versatile, surprisingly, because usually you think, oh, they're getting this fast. It must be all it can do is transformers. No, um, there's definitely going to be companies which take that strategy. It's like they're going to be transformer machines. Just like in the Bitcoin era, you know, they tried to make custom Bitcoin machines yeah. out of ASICs. But you saw how fast that that space kind of died, right? Because the, the space is changing too fast, right? Like yeah. transformers may be a good basis for today, but who knows what's going to happen in two years, how these things will evolve. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I've, I've seen um, Jonathan use reference to like a Galton board, right? It's really the way to think of languages, anything that's linear. And where are you advantaged in the way that you process data in a linear fashion, sort of, like you said, hammers on the side of the lane that are, that are processing that data more efficiently, right? And I think once you start getting to data center scale, that really shows its value. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I would, I would invite people uh, to be curious and go actually back to our early days of our YouTube channel. Um, we even had like, I think it was the second gen of YOLO on there and we were doing some computer vision with YOLO. We did like a really cool blackjack game. Like we've, we've done all kinds of radical things. And even on the drug discovery one with Argonne National Labs, that model, which was a completely custom implementation um, and, and not a huge system, you know, their original system was processing uh, that model, looking at drug compounds sticking to a protein. I think it was taking three and a half days every time they'd want to run a drug compound. And we got that down to around 17 minutes each round of, of the simulation. I mean, it was insane how much faster we made that, but it was because the implementation was really complementary to being linear. And the same thing when Adobe suggested we do the style GAN model, right? When we, we mapped those styles and we have that video up on YouTube as well. Um, they originally said this runs at about seven seconds per round. And we got that down to well below a second, uh, running actually eight styles at the same time. So it's quite impressive. Um, so this one comes up a lot. I'm going to ask the next question. Uh, is training coming? Um, we get asked this one all the time. Igor, what's, what's, what's the answer here? I think as a startup, we got to stay focused. So right now, I think inference is the focus. We want to drive that hard. Uh, the, the architecture itself, does it lend itself to training? Yes. I think a lot of the benefits transfer, but uh, inference is our focus. Um, yeah. We have a small team. We got to execute well. Or we're going to stay focused. Yeah. And I will yeah. say there, there has been, yeah, go ahead, Andrew, please. No. Yeah. Just to add to that, like ultimately from a business perspective, like the, the chip, like I said, is turning compete. We can we can do training, and we have done training in terms of our internal applications. But from a business perspective, the market is where inference is at today. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Jonathan always says this. You know, the number of inferences scales with the number of users in the world, whereas training it scales with the number of ML engineers, right? ML teams, which is much much smaller. Mm -hmm. And even when you look at the industry today. Because training has been so expensive and hard to do, it's almost like the industry has kind of pivoted away from needing it because it's so hard. And what I mean by that, what you'll find is, well, a lot of companies, you know, unless you're a Microsoft, unless you're like one of these big tech companies that can afford the servers to actually do the training, you're right. fine with just a foundational model and tweaking it. So what I mean by tweaking? LoRa's, fine tuning. It's 1,000, 10,000 X cheaper to do that. So training is actually a shrinking area. And it's, it's right. hard to actually create a sustainable business around training right now, um, which is why we're, we're focused on, on the real problems that people are facing. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's definitely not our focus. Um, I do know we have one customer that did use Grok for training, but it was such a unique and novel use case. Uh, it was, it was sort of out there. So, okay. Um, I think this next one is, is I I'm, I'm just going to take this one. Are Grok LPUs PCIe cards? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. I have the technical aptitude to answer that one. <laughs> Anything you want to add to it though, Igor? I mean, we, we, uh, I think the architecture lends itself on anything from embedded IP on a chip all the way to the cloud. Really, it is a unique architecture. And the beauty of it is that it's so it's simplified, it's regular, it's easy to program. So the software solution that Andrew's team is providing kind of spans that whole gamut of different form factors that we can deploy it in. Our current focus is LLMs. That's the sexiest thing on, on the planet right now. So we're pushing there, but technically we can go across the across the stack. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, we we often say sand to sky. Yeah. Um, okay, so this one's popped up a bunch in in Discord and on Twitter. Are you planning to do function calling? Um, you know, I know this is really getting deep into the the sort of the the ask of the developer community. Andrew, do you want to address that one? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes. Right. I mean, this plays in with um, some of the recent announcements. So we have essentially acquired Definitive, a relatively mm -hmm. successful but small startup. Uh, that team has a strong expertise in machine learning applications and cloud and cloud infrastructure. And, you know, you, the proof is in the pudding. You really have seen the acceleration of all these applications and interfaces and APIs like function calling. Uh, which we do plan to serve uh, to the community. Yep, it's uh, it's an exciting time. We're learning in real time with the community what what it is that everybody wants and where should we focus our efforts. Um, I want to give a quick shout out as well. I see a lot of comments in the chat and I see that we've got some Groksters in the room as well answering those questions. Thanks y'all for doing that. Um, I know those are very specific things that people want to know about. Uh, so so please keep supporting the community there and, and moderating. Um, Okay, so now we're going to get a little bit more into the, the weeds of the models. The next question that came up, do you have an enterprise version where we can run specific Mistral or Llama-based fine-tuned models, which are fine-tuned on our data? Can we upload our own weights file? Uh, you know, Andrew, you mentioned fine-tuning earlier. Um, what would you say about this? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is like the te technology obviously supports it, right? Like you, you have a different set of weights. We can suck that in uh, and update the the programs that are run on the LPUs. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a model serving API to enable this, again related to my last answer with the definitive, like this is something that we will definitely enable yep. uh, in the coming months in terms of allowing our own customers bring in their own weights and running it on the, our LPUs. Perfect, perfect. And I I think just in in adding to that, you know where it says specifically Mistral or Llama based, you know, this is one of the things that we're also monitoring very, very closely, which is what is the next model the community wants? What is the open source world really driving us to? So not only, you know, is Mistral and Llama what we offer today, but there may be the next thing that gets dropped. You know, I think everybody's curious about Llama 3. Everybody's wondering what Mistral is going to do next. And so at the same time, we're looking at what those features and services might be. We're also monitoring what is the next model and, you know, whether it's another MOE or something similar. So uh, exciting times there. Uh, Igor, this one was, I think, for you, um, shifting a little bit to the business side. What would the specific impacts to Grok be? Were there, let's say, a drastic political unrest in Taiwan? Uh, I think uh, I think from the Grok perspective, obviously nobody wants anything like that. <laughs> I think it's going to no, be a big yeah. impact of the world. But from the Grok perspective, we're fairly isolated. Uh, so if you look at our chip, is uh, manufactured in upstate New York in Global Foundries, Malta. New York. Uh, it's packaged in Bromont, Canada, which is um, a couple of hundred kilometers up uh, from uh, from Malta. And then uh, 
the the folks that are kind of programming this chip and kind of the software is in Toronto where Andrew is and uh, his team there. So we are probably really well isolated. We don't have dependency on HBMs from Korea or uh, Kowas from Taiwan. So it's it's really uh, we have a perfect kind of uh, uh, architecture that's assembled here in North America. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're quite neutralized, right? Which is which is good, and then to even expand on that, and we'll we'll probably talk about this a little bit later based on some of the other questions. But also, our next chip is actually being fabbed in Taylor, Texas, so we're going to be able to stay with that neutralization. So it's quite stable for us. Yeah. Um. All right, this one's a a, a shift back. Uh, Andrew, I'm I'm heavily invested in constrained generation. Uh, and one thing that no one seems to have done, but would be huge, is to constrain the generation and or inject context dynamically in the middle of generation. And then they've got a, a series of examples here where the LLM is taking the outputs and then making sure that those numbers as it outputs conforms to a rule and a sequence, et cetera. But I think the the high level here is, you know, prompt engineering. <laughs> so maybe maybe you can offer a little a little context here. Yeah, I mean, ultimately the team has exposed a pretty general API. Um, and even internally, I think um, there there was a video that we posted where we did show a reg demo, for example. Yeah. And so that the way I would look at it is as long as you can access that API and you provide the right prompts, you can massage that however you want. Um, and obviously we're going to add tooling on top of that again, with our partners at uh, Definitive to, to build this out such that it's a bit easier to use. But yeah, like I think this is perfectly in line what we plan to do to, to empower our, our users to enable these interesting applications and, and get more sophisticated prompts into our system. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there it goes back to your your turn complete comment, but the other part of their question said, uh, you know, is this possible with your hardware? Um, you know, could you support it without changing the hardware? And, and, and obviously we could, um, yeah. because of it being Turing complete. Right. And, and I don't think a lot of people are aware because when they, when they access the API or they go to grok chat, they see a couple of models, but actually the last I checked and you, you probably know better than me, but it, it, last time I checked, we were hundreds of models were actually compiled from hugging face in our system. Do you, do you want to talk to that just very briefly? I'm going to add it into our list. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I mean, this goes back to, you know, do you do more than LLMs, right? You have an LPU. Like ultimately the, the compiler was generated in a way um, that was essentially agnostic to workload. I mean, there's some salient characteristics about machine learning workloads, you know, their data flow graphs, relatively static. So mm -hmm. those things played to our strengths. But beyond that, we're not really doing anything specific. Like we don't have kernels in the compiler. Right, we're not. That like still writing. blows. That still blows people's minds. It never fails when we're at an event and we go, yeah, and we don't have any kernel elves or kernel. There's no kernel thing going on, and people go, yeah, 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 but your kernel. And I'm like, I don't think you heard the words <laughs> I just said. There are no kernels, <laughs> so maybe elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, I mean, 100. percent It's hard for people to understand because uh, everyone is thinking about things from like a graphics card or CPU framework, right? Like that's the world view. So of course, right. you know, you're building kernels because of course, you know, you have reactive components with the hardware, you know, of course you have to do that. No, we've kind of flipped everything on its head. Like we have deterministic hardware. There's no reactive components. It's hundred percent transparent to the software. So we don't need to do that. Like we've essentially simplified the problem for ourselves. Um, and don't get me wrong, like the, the problems that a lot of the big companies are facing and like how they're building out kernels, it makes 100% sense for them to take that strategy. It is the right strategy for them to take because it's a not a solvable problem, quite frankly. It's an NP complete. People have been doing this for decades and ultimately they've, they've, they've stopped, right? They've, they've fallen back to these kernel libraries because that's how you get the best possible performance. We don't have that luxury. We don't have a thousand engineers just writing assembly code. Uh, right. So we had to do something different. Otherwise, we wouldn't have survived, quite frankly. That's what it comes yep. down to. Yep. And that's where it became radically novel, right? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, and speaking about like those those sort of problem statements, I see one of the questions someone offered. Uh, very specific. 
Does the compiler need to use backtracking in case it paints itself into a corner? Or do you have tricks to avoid that? I feel like somebody's been reading an ISCA paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a fair question. Because again, when you come from like a CPU world or traditional scheduling, you're going to hit this problem, right? Yep. Again, NP complete problems. You have reactive components. You don't know when vector X is going to go to you know, hardware component Y. Those things are, are non-deterministic in a lot of respects. The way we avoid it is effectively we don't have those problems. We, you know, essentially, if you take a look at the architecture, it's one dimensional. Mm -hmm. It essentially becomes a 1D packing problem. And so you really just have to go forward in time, no backtracking, and just schedule things back to back, vector by vector. And that's effectively what we've done. That was Jonathan's vision from day one. Yeah. Um, and it some it seemingly seems obvious now, but it's actually really hard to grok and understand because it's so different. Like effectively we're avoiding those NP complete problems that you have to deal with in other spatial architectures, CPUs, graphic cards. We just, we just avoid it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think even at, 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 at a business level, high level, this is, we've been asked in the past, like, Oh, why aren't you doing these traditional benchmark sites? And why aren't you doing these other methodologies? And of course our answer has always been, because those were based on how GPUs were engineered and then how you test them at that scale, right? And it, it, it's, it's just not the same thing. So we're really happy now that there's sites out there like artificial analysis and any scale that are sharing these leaderboard benchmarks that allow us to really demonstrate inference, you know, um, purely as a, as a service and at scale. Let's, uh, let's get to the next one because it's, it's getting into a system level uh, conversation. So far, we have Grok's token throughput per user, but we haven't been given the token throughput of the entire system. Uh, this person said, I believe this is an important metric for assessing the effectiveness of Grok, uh, Grok's inferencing capabilities. And with it, I could express my support for Grok within my company. Um, we serve local inferencing capabilities to various clients. So here's my question. The question is, what is the token throughput of Grok system built to run Llama 2 70 billion FP16? And how about a Grok system built for Mixtral 8x7b or FP16? Um, is there any information you can offer about this? So I'll start with Andrew, and then uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll turn to Igor at the system level as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, right? Like, we, we have these systems, they're, they're cranking out extremely good latency, but ultimately, what's the overall throughput, which ultimately translates to the cost of the system? Um, I mean, the way we handle it is effectively, I, I allude to in the first question, really, like, how do we actually execute things on the Grok chips? And we execute them using pipeline parallelism. So what that means is we're going to have multiple users concurrently within the hardware or system kind of executing in this sort of assembly line fashion. It's like going down this train, so to speak. And that's where we can get the massive throughput gains such that this is extremely cost effective. And the proof is in the pudding, right? Like we have our uh, Grok API up and running already today. Mm -hmm. It's serving thousands of users, thousands of requests concurrently. Like it would be impossible to do that basically if we did not have this feature implemented today. So we're already implementing uh, extremely high throughput with the overall system. Um, but there's yeah. still a lot of room to grow, right? Yeah. Like, I, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I looked at one of the dashboards the other day and there was a, a narrow time slice with a spike. And I think there was uh, just in that particular instance, you know, that that few seconds, there was something like 3,200 users making more than 37,000 requests, you know, within that narrow time slice of a spike. And it was just, when you look at that and zoom out, suddenly you get into the millions and, and, and millions of requests. Um, you know, Igor, what do you, what do you think about this in regards to uh, the system, the, the, the overall uh, ability to serve requests? And then I guess, where is that going? Yeah, yeah. So as Andrew pointed out, I mean, <clears throat> the throughput is already uh, kind of uh, 
there to support millions of requests, thousands of kind of users already. We are a small startup, so there's limited amount of hardware just yet, but we are ordering hundreds or thousands of racks that are coming in basically to kind of satisfy the demand that we have. But we also have to realize that this is really early days for Grok, right? Like we like to compare Grok to somebody that's kind of super established, like GPUs with massive amounts of deployments and kind of try the comparisons. The reality is uh, GPUs were developed, I don't know, 25 years ago for the purposes of graphics. They're kind of uh, are tapering off in their kind of improvements. It's more of an evolutionary improvement. What we are seeing with the LPU is more of a revolutionary improvement, right? Um, and here we're already seeing like really great throughput. And then that is kind of going to ratchet up on multiple fronts, right? So we have 14 nanometer silicon right now. So all these amazing uh, achievements are being achieved uh, with the 14 nanometer single chip module silicon, right? So we're kind of being, uh, we're fighting with uh, two hands tied behind our back <laughs> right now. Uh, so on the silicon side, we're moving to four nanometer. Uh, just if you just look at Moore's law scaling there, you get uh, a couple of X improvement, three, four X improvement just in technology improvements alone. Uh, then you add to that uh, any learning that we have taken from the previous design, any architecture improvements, new uh, kind of interconnect, uh, better systems on top of that. So all these things are just really multipliers that are just starting to come in, right? Um, and uh, this will continue, right? Uh, this is a new architecture. We're gonna be improving it and driving that. So we are on that very steep curve right now, and we're just at the beginning of that steep curve. So multiples are coming uh, uh, to, uh, as an improvement uh, versus something that's kind of sitting already at state-of-art silicon at four nanometer with six HPMs with COAS. You've kind of brute forced this to, to that point. I think we're just going to uh, skyrocket past that. So uh, so this is the exciting part about being a Grok. And then there's the deterministic the architecture just opens up so much silicon optimization, system optimization. Mm -hmm opportunities that really do not exist on any other systems that I've seen out there. So, yeah. And I know um, a lot of people have been curious about this. Um, you know, the, if we were just to brute force 14 nanometer to four nanometer, uh, you know, back of the napkin math, uh, if we did no optimization, no change whatsoever, we're just shrinking, right? What, what would happen? Like where, what does this gain us? I mean, you can get like three, four X just for 14 to four, just like that alone. But then you have to look at C2C latencies and bandwidth. And those are one of the key differentiators. Those are moving significantly more than the three or four X. Then you look at system improvement of perf per TCO. We want to actually deploy very efficient systems. Uh, that kind of uh, give us the best cost per LPU deployed. All these improvements are yet to be brought to bear here, and we just need uh, money and time uh, to get it across the finish line. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's fun. So I, I know this one uh, uh, wasn't in the list, but I, I, I've heard this question come up, so I want to take uh, the moment as an opportunity. Andrew, you know, we talk a lot about going from 14 nanometer to 4 nanometer, Obviously, there's other optimizations that we're putting in there that are going to be dramatically more than 4x. Uh, that roadmap is very exciting. Um, what does this mean on the compiler side? Do you guys have to reinvent everything? Do you have to go back and and start over to work with this new scale? Is there is there some dramatic change that has to happen for you here, or does this generationally what you and the team have established in the compiler is that now the foundation of an entire generational movement of processor category? Yeah, I like how you phrase it. Like, I, it, it's definitely in that that latter category. Like, ultimately, you know, each time we 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 hit something that's that's different or a new level of scale, what we ultimately often will do is just enhance what we've already built, and then those benefits move forward with the technology and software stack in tandem. Like, it just kind of carries forward. So. Anything that we do today in terms of optimization, it's really paying dividends. And again, this, is, this stems from the fact we are not doing custom kernels or one-offs within the compiler stack. Yeah. The idea is, okay, let's come up with generalized heuristics and generalized approaches to our mm -hmm. vectorizing compiler 
and multi-chip compilation approach. And then through that, you know, specific instances like the latest and greatest Llama variant, you know, Llama 3 is coming out in July. They may expose some sort of esoteric uh, nuance to a heuristic that we have to enhance, but we're sort of carrying everything else forward with us. Right. We're not kind of like, oh, there's Llama 3 now, now we forget about Llama 2, so we have to like re rejig everything. No, it's kind of, oh, there's Llama 3 that complements what we're doing already, Let's enhance that, and now everything else kind of lifts up. That's the right. general approach. Yeah, I love that. I think I think this leans into a topic that I'm going to jump ahead in the queue, and then I know we have a couple of live questions uh, I want to get to as well, if possible. And and don't worry, guys, we will do more of these if we don't uh, get your question answered today. We're we're learning how to be Discord people. We will, we will do more of these. Um. So you 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 talked about how we're carrying this forward. Right. I think the one thing that we haven't broached today is what we often call developer velocity. There's a lot of people that are on the call that are developers that are really excited. Obviously, we recently acquired Definitive Intelligence. They're leaders in the, the developer world um, and deeply experienced. So because you're able to carry so much of the, the foundational work in the compiler forward, um, can you talk a little bit about what is it like, or what's the vision or the goal for the developer experience from, from your perspective? Yeah, the, the ultimate goal is to ensure that the developer focuses on their problems and they are not tying their solution to any specific implementation. So what do I mean by that? Like, look at PyTorch, right? Extremely powerful framework, extremely popular. I'm sure a lot of the developers are using it here today. Sure. But what's the biggest pain? Like you have to oftentimes, in order to get good performance, customize your PyTorch code to the underlying substrate technology underneath. Simple example, convolutions. How many convolutional operators are there in PyTorch? I think there's almost 100, right? Like right. And they're all kind of doing the same thing, but they're tied to specific implementations. Mm -hmm. Like there's like, you know, CNN, ReLU, Intel DNN or something like that, underscore, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll have one for another vendor, another vendor. Like it's, it just, it's overly complicated. So that is something that we have to help the industry move away from. Mm -hmm. And because again, we have the automated vectorizing compiler, we have this versatile architecture with on die memory, high bandwidth memory on chip. We don't have to do that. Um, and so that's the ultimate goal is make sure that developers can move fast on their own and they don't have to kind of shim themselves to any one specific technology. Yeah, there's sort of the the tax of the previous solution becomes the cost of tomorrow, right? Yeah. It's it's very much in that space. Someone someone asked a question related to this and I know we're going to be wrapping here pretty soon. Um but this person I think related related to that it's and it looks like it's an Xargon uh friend. Um, they said, are all common functions operations provided to developers in PyTorch, TensorFlow, CUDA translated or usable on device along with saved weights without needing to redefine model architectures? Yeah, I, I don't know if this answers the question, but like, like how we actually approach this is we decompose all those PyTorch operators into a canonical set. That canonical set is maybe, you know, 50-ish operators, less than that if you kind of count certain operators as like the same. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're basically breaking up these like thousand ops into like tens of ops. You have the option to use those tens of ops directly if you want for your workload, mm -hmm. or you can just st stay in the PyTorch ecosystem, go to Onyx and then uh, drive that through our, our software flow. Perfect. Yeah. And I think for those of that, that have been with us on the journey, um, we have a lot of tools around this, right? Where you look at Grok flow or some of the other things uh, to help to optimize when you're converting over. And, and this is the advantage of being deterministic, right? We can know at compile time exactly how things are going to perform, what you're missing, what your needs are, where you could optimize further. So there's a lot of, a lot of good resources that we can actually offer the developers as well to try to, to try to improve developer velocity. And that's one of the goals. How do we accelerate time to production? Um, that's a metric that we measure a lot. Well, uh, gentlemen, this has been really, really fun. And I think the, the chat conversation has been very active. So I want to thank the community for joining us today. Um, all 104 of you that managed to get in here, uh, we'll, we'll see about expanding this room next time so we can bring in more folks. 
Um, but I believe we are at time. So we're going to call it here, but I would just, as we're closing, I would invite everybody. Obviously most of you are likely already in our discord server. Make sure you join us also on Twitter or any of our other social channels. And we'll do another one of these and we'll try to capture your questions again. And, um, you know, we want to keep hearing from you about what you and the developer community and the tech community want so that we can push Grok even further. So with that, we'll say goodbye to everyone. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your Wednesday afternoon, evening or morning, wherever you are in the world. All right. Thanks, gang. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.